Good evening, and welcome to Mike Jesus Langer Presents. Tonight, a tale of VHS tapes, eggs, and science. Don't Watch the Adventures of Professor Egghead was originally released in November of 2020 and is now returning for a second, scientifically accurate season starting this Friday. If you'd like to join me and other empirically minded individuals for the premiere, check out the link in the pinned comment below. Also, if you would like to spread the scientific observations of the good professor, make sure to comment egg and like the video to help it travel through the pipes of the algorithm. If pulp horror content is up your alley, feel free to subscribe and hit that bell icon for notifications. New stories are released every Friday and compilations of old series are released every Tuesday. Finally, I am legally obligated to leave you with a bit of advice. If you stumble upon a VHS tape or any other media containing episodes of the adventures of Professor Egghead, Burn them. Daddy's VHS collection never came up in conversation. Sure, occasionally I'd say something about the oblique pop culture reference t-shirt he wore, and I recall having a discussion or two about his obsession with 90s sitcoms, but most of our time together was spent talking about the strangeness of the locals. I originally moved to Prague to squeeze as much fun out of my 20s as I could in a cost-effective manner. Beer was considerably cheaper than water. Rent was infinitely more affordable than New England. And there's something to be said about dating in the porn capital of the world. Teddy's reasons for moving to Prague, on the other hand, were a bit more cryptic. When I would ask him about his departure from the States, he would wax poetic about the dark gothic streets, about the strangeness of the city about how he could feel Kafka's perpetually confused spirit drifting through the subways. But it wasn't until one rum-soaked evening that he gave me something concrete. You can also find some pretty niche VHS tapes here, he said, and I like collecting VHS tapes. Maybe he wanted me to press the subject further, maybe he wanted to show me his collection, but to be honest I didn't care. I liked the dude. He was weird, but I liked him. Frail and covered in adult acne, Teddy was funny looking and meek, but the guy had a heart of gold. Whenever I found myself lost in the absurd bureaucracy of the city, or was looking for an explanation to the strange customs and the Pragas, Teddy was more than happy to help. He moved to the city just a year before me, yet somehow he managed to get a grasp on the strange consonant-filled lingo of the locals, and knew of just about every expat-friendly gem hidden around the dark alleys. We were on friendly enough terms to be conflict-free roommates and occasionally grab a drink together. I liked the dude. I just didn't want to enter, you know, check out my weird hobby territory. It wasn't until he went missing that I saw his collection. A regular VHS tape fits about four episodes of a 20-minute show. Judging by the sparse amount of space available in Teddy's room, he had enough tapes to stay occupied for weeks. Whilst Teddy was privy to all the drama of my personal life, I didn't know much about his. I never met any of Teddy's friends, but I presumed he had some. For the first two weeks of his absence, I assumed that Teddy was just on some spontaneous hiking trip with some friends I never heard about. One worried phone call from his father dispersed those illusions. Teddy was missing. And Teddy only had one friend in Prague. Me. His father flew in from Maryland, and for six months he stayed in his son's cramped room. It was miserable rooming with a grieving father. But the guy continued covering Teddy's share of the rent, and I didn't want to be soulless. For six months, he searched the city for some sort of evidence that his son was alive, but Teddy's disappearance was total. I had no leads. The police had no leads. And after half a year of searching, Teddy's father ran out of hope. Long after it became clear that his son was not coming back, Teddy's father flew home to hold a memorial service. They invited me to come and speak at the service, even offered to cover my airfare to Baltimore, but I declined. I didn't know Teddy well enough to speak to his grieving family, and traveling across the Atlantic is about as pleasant as a sleep deprivation experiment. Instead, as his family gathered to mourn, I made my way to Teddy's VCR. I was going to put on a random Friends episode. Teddy seemed to have really enjoyed that show, but when I tried to pop in the cassette, there was resistance from the machine. The slot was already filled with a different tape. Adventures of Professor Egghead, Season 1, Episodes 1-4 to 4. 
To pay my respects, I figured I'd do my best and try to indulge in Teddy's weird hobby. I pushed the tape back into the machine and pressed play. A coffee shop flickered to life on screen. On first glance, there didn't seem to be anything wrong with it. A group of teens gathered with laptops in what looked to be a study group. Out by the window, two friends had an animated conversation. A small line of people dressed in grey office garb stood in line waiting for their coffee. Yet the longer I watched the coffee shop scene play out, the more I noticed something was off. The teens relentlessly typed away at their computers, but the screens of their laptops were turned off. The conversation by the window was filled with exciting hand gestures and bouts of laughter, yet the two friends made no sound when they moved their lips. The line of office workers stood patiently in line, but no orders were ever filled. The whole coffee shop seemed stuck in the same 30 second loop that repeated over and over. It was as if everyone was waiting for something. Sitting behind the thick screen of Teddy's television, I waited as well. It was faint at first. I even paused the tape to check whether the sound wasn't coming from my neighbor's apartment. But soon enough, it became clear that the noise was originating from the television. Somewhere off screen, a live studio audience was clapping and cheering, anticipating the arrival of a beloved character. Then the door to the coffee shop opened and he entered. The studio audience hollered with joy as he appeared on the screen, but my stomach went flush with discomfort. This man, this creature, this thing that stood at the entrance of the coffee shop defied all reason. A face of a human, a desperately tired human, drooped from his egg-shaped body. Over his stubby limbs he wore a dirty lab coat and the sparse nest of hair on his pointed scalp looked like it hadn't been washed in years. But it was his eyes that stoked true discomfort in my core. Bloodshot and lined with yellow grime, they stared straight into the camera. I am Professor Aiken! The abomination screams in a queer accent, drenched in anger. I have come to awaken myself for another day of science! The studio audience's joyous clapping turned to wild laughter. Yet no one in the coffee shop found the creature's outburst funny. They all seemed scared. With rage-filled stomps, the egg-shaped being lumbered his way past the frightening business folk to the front of the line. I demand boiled water! I demand boiled water that has been strained through the crushed beans of the coffee plant. If I am to get any science done on this day, I must have caffeine coursing through my powerful veins. Everyone in the coffee shop seemed wholly uncomfortable with the existence of this Eggman. The presence radiated a fury throughout the entire establishment, but it was the young barista he was facing who received most of his ire. She looked to be on the edge of a panic attack. I'm sorry, sir. She mumbled biting her lip in discomfort. I don't understand you. No one understands the egghead! He screamed, raising the nubs of his arms into the sky. No one will ever understand the egghead! This drove the studio audience wild. The deafening bout of canned laughter boomed from the television. With a deep-seated confusion in my heart, I cut it off with a remote and went to the balcony for a cigarette. For a while, I tried to make sense of why Teddy would watch something so unhinged, but the thoughts didn't stick around for long. Teddy was a weird guy who was into weird things. Trying to understand his taste was just as futile as the six-month search effort. A part of me wanted to believe that he was still hiding somewhere in the smoggy city that stretched out beyond the balcony, but I knew the truth. Teddy was gone, and somewhere out in Baltimore, his family was gathered around a corpseless funeral, saying goodbye. His father cried a lot, just about every night for the first couple of months. It wasn't until I had to put on headphones to drown out a grown man's sobs that I realized how thin the walls of the apartment were. Even muffled through blaring music, those 2 a.m. howls were scratched into my memory. Standing on my balcony, alone, hearing faint echoes of the man's wails, I realized I needed a drink. As I rushed out of the house in search of company, however, the television screen in Teddy's room caught my eye. The screaming egg creature was still staring at the camera, 
stuck in an angry shout. If Teddy was around and he sat me down to watch the madness, I probably would have lasted longer. A twinge of guilt sparked in my chest for never humoring Teddy's obsession. As soon as I resumed the tape, the cafe was replaced with a barbershop. Much like the previous scene, there was an air of artificiality surrounding everything on the screen. A heavy middle-aged woman hovered over the single customer that the barbershop had with scissors in her hands, yet she never made a single cut. Another employee was using a broom to clean up the remains of a previous haircut, but he never actually disposed of the hair. He just pushed it around the floor in a circle. Even the bright colored fish in the barbershop aquarium, they seemed to be swimming around in a steady formation. The barbershop was stuck in a familiar 30 second loop, waiting for something to happen. After a minute or two, the cheering of the studio audience started to reverberate through the quiet room. I am Professor Egghead! The mad creature raved as he burst through the door. I demand that the dead cells be removed from my scalp with sharp knives so I can be born anew. His words were much angrier than before. The egg-shaped monstrosity was foaming at his mouth with rage, but his eyes still seemed comatose. I am Professor Egghead, and I demand your attention! He yelled, impotently waving his short arms. The studio audience found his frustration hilarious. Everyone in the barber shop was doing their best to look away. But the malformed scientist would not be ignored. He wobbled up to the occupied chair and started to nudge it, making the hairdresser's job impossible. Please, sir, can you just wait your turn? She finally said, doing her best to look away from his horrible suffering eyes. No! Professor Egghead screamed. I demand attention now! I demand my scalp be cleansed of filth so I can wholeheartedly commit my egg-shaped body to science! With one swift motion, the nightmarish creature grabbed the man in the chair and threw him to the ground. There was stunning force in the stocky limbs of his. With a spine-chilling crack, the innocent customer slammed skull first into the floor. He lay there, unmoving. The studio audience saw the random act of violence as a pinnacle of comedy. There are no more customers for you to serve! Professor Egghead screeched as a faint trickle of blood crawled across the white floor. It is now time for you to serve the Egghead. It is now time for you to cleanse my scalp! With clumsy effort, the creature climbed up on top of the chair. The hairdresser was extremely distressed, but the audience found the Eggman's climb to be a deserving of ruckus applause. Bring out the knives and alter my appearance! He screamed, kicking his stubby legs in frustration. I am a busy man, and there is science to be done! Do what I demand! For a moment, it looked like the hairdresser was going to say something like she was going to decline the malformed maniac service, but she reconsidered. With shaking hands, she grabbed a hold of the greasy tufts of hair on his oval scalp and started to cut. I am Professor Egghead, the creature screamed, looking straight into the camera. I always get what I desire. All shall be given to me in the name of science. It was as if he could see me, as if his tired eyes were reaching past the television screen and trying to bring me into his demented world. The glimpse into Teddy's confounding media diet was enough for me. I still didn't understand why the guy would watch the tape, but I was certain I wanted to turn it off. I reached for the remote with my sweaty hands, but before I could turn off the television, the scene changed again. For a moment, I was sure my eyes were playing tricks on me that I was having some sort of psychotic break with reality. But the longer I looked at the screen, the more I was certain of what I was seeing. I desperately scrolled through my phone looking for Teddy's father's phone number, but I kept my eyes glued to the screen. A colorful fast food restaurant flickered to life on the television. The line to the counter was long, but stood still. 
The customers held their burgers in anticipation, but never ate. And somewhere off in the distance, a studio audience started to clap. Two rings. Teddy's father picked up right away. I found your son, I said. The red uniform was an unusual choice of clothing, and the beginnings of a patchy beard were starting to grow on his face, but I recognized Teddy right away. He was standing behind the counter, nervous, as if he knew what was awaiting him. You found my son? said the voice on the phone, shaking with breathlessness. Where? Where's my boy? I tried to explain what was happening, but I kept on tripping over my words. The tape, the Eggman, the insane eyes, I didn't know where to start. Before I could gather my thoughts into something coherent, the television exploded in another wave of celebration. I am Professor Egghead! The fever dream boomed from the screen. I demand the grilled carcass of an animal between two pieces of processed wheat. I must receive nourishment before I indulge in the science. I'm sorry, sir, Teddy whimpered, unsure of how to speak to the monstrosity which waddled before him. There are other customers. If you just wait your place in line... There are no other customers than me, Professor Egghead! The creature shrieked as he shoved the innocent bystanders to the floor. I demand flesh and bread! I demand fuel for my body so I can commit my mind to science! One by one, they crashed headfirst to the floor to the crackling joy of the studio audience. Soon enough, the egg-shaped abomination was face to face with Teddy. You found my boy? cried the voice on the phone. Please, please tell me my boy is safe. I will destroy all in my path in the name of science. The walking nightmare hollered. Bring me a feast worthy of a philosopher king. With each uncomfortable twitch of Teddy's face, the audience on screen exploded in another fit of hysterical laughter. I tried to turn down the sound of the television so I could hear the grieving man on the phone, but it was to no avail. With every press, the remote, the Eggman shouted louder. With every decreased decibel, the studio audience became wilder. Leaving a desperate Teddy flickering on the screen, I escaped to the balcony. Please, please do not joke about this, he whimpered on the phone. My heart cannot handle cruelty right now. I took a deep breath, lit up a cigarette, and explained myself. I told him about the tape, about Professor Egghead, about Teddy. All I got in response was silence. I tried to imagine how I would answer if I was on the other side of the phone, how I would make sense of it all, but I couldn't. I waited for the man's response with echoes of canned applause playing in the back of my mind. This is not a joke? Teddy's father finally asked. No, I said. It all sounds crazy, but... A wave of dizziness washed through me. My cigarette plummeted down to the streets below. Suddenly the overcast city in front of me was impossibly bright, as if someone turned on a thousand fluorescent bulbs across the sky. The applause. The canned applause that I thought was a simple memory in the back of my skull had grown to a tangible volume. My legs felt weak. Fearing the balcony railing, I stumbled back into my apartment. I am Professor Egghead, boomed the television. I have arrived to exchange monetary tokens for goods. I must stock my domicile quickly so that I can commit the rest of my time on this planet to science. The audience clapped and laughed, but suddenly they went silent. The only thing I could hear was a gentle, repetitive beep. The beep of a supermarket checkout aisle. What is this? He screamed. In the name of science, what is this? Past the buzzing lights in front of my eyes, I could see a spot of dark. With nowhere else to go, I blindly crawled towards it, desperately hoping to regain my sight. Where is he? 
Professor Egghead demanded. How am I meant to make a purchase when the sales clerk is missing? As I felt my way towards one part of the universe that wasn't drenched in eye-burning light, a tower of cassettes collapsed against my back. I was back in Teddy's room, and I was looking up at the screen. The television was calming to my eyes, but it stirred fear in my heart. I was looking at the fluorescent lit checkout line of a supermarket. A trail of blood and bodies led up to an unattended register. A defiant Professor Egghead gripped his shopping cart and stared into the camera with dead eyes. I have taken temporary leave from the world of science to purchase goods, and this is how I'm rewarded. Where is the shop assistant? I demand the shop assistant. The studio audience was in complete silence. All that could be heard was the gentle beep of a far-off checkout machine and the professor's labored breathing. Where is he? I demand answers. Where is he? Spit was flying from his mouth onto the camera. In a show of rage, he started jabbing his shopping cart in the direction of the audience. I am world-renowned scientist Professor Egghead. I do not have time for this. He wheeled the cart back and forth, foaming at the mouth as if he were a rabid dog. But something behind the camera caught his exhausted eye. Hey, he said, his voice losing all fury. There you are. His sudden change of tone made me flinch away from the screen, but his dull eyes followed me. Professor Egghead can see you, he said, his eyes still tired but his mouth forming into a thin-lipped smile. Come back where you belong. Let me pay for my goods so that I can return to work in the field of science. The clapping resumed again. It was quiet at first, but as the abhorrent grin on the television grew, the audience became louder and louder. Whatever was happening, the audience loved it. Come back to Professor Egghead, he said, flashing a smile of thin yellow teeth. I demand attention. The light around me reverberated with glowing strength. The clapping and cheering and whistling was so loud it felt as if my eyes were about to pop out of their sockets. I demand attention, the Eggman screamed, the rage returning to his voice. I demand it! I demand it! I demand! With shaking hands, I gripped the remote of the television and made it all disappear. The screen went dark. And so did the blinding light. I was back in Teddy's room, alone and drenched in sweat. For a moment, I just lay on the floor, staring up at the cracks in the ceiling, trying to find a loose thread of sanity in an insane world. But before I could even begin to process the madness I had witnessed, my phone started to ring. It was Teddy's father. He begged me to turn the tape back on, to rewind and find the image of his lost son, to bring some semblance of hope back into his life. But I couldn't. I refused to be in the same room as that tape, let alone to watch it again. Whatever was on the cassette was cruel and dangerous. I didn't want to end up like Teddy. He offered money. He wept. He got angry. But nothing he could say or do could make me go back into that hellscape. I offered to mail the tape to him. But the idea of entrusting the footage to the postal service drove the man furious. After two hours on the phone, Teddy's father informed me that he would be flying to Prague and retrieving the VHS tape himself. I didn't argue with the man. The thought of not being alone with the confounding reality of Professor Egghead even eased my mind somewhat. With a last minute flight, Teddy's father would be back in Prague in less than two days. I figured I could hold out that long. For a moment I was calm, but that moment didn't last long. As I went to sleep that night, I couldn't escape the vision of those dull eyes and that angry mouth. Even as I write this. With the morning sun quietly peeking into my room, the visage of the egg-shaped man still haunts me. 
Yet, it's not the mere idea of Professor Egghead that's stealing sleep from me right now. No. There's something much worse that is keeping me awake. Throughout the night, as I found myself leaving behind my worries and nodding off to sleep, I started to hear things. I hear beeps. Whenever I'm about to fall asleep, I hear the gentle beeps of a checkout machine. And beneath those beeps, I hear steadily growing applause. I fear that if I fall asleep, even for a second, I will be transported into the same demented reality where the egg-shaped man makes his demands. I fear that I will disappear just like Teddy. I don't know how long I can stay awake. I don't know how to make this stop. All I know is that I don't want to go back there. I don't want to witness another one of Professor Egghead's adventures. She knocks just after I've finished my sixth coffee of the morning. I hug her tighter than anyone I've ever hugged in my life. For a moment, with her body pressed against mine, I feel sane. I almost convinced myself that everything that has happened over the past 24 hours was just one long fever dream. Yet as she kisses me and I close my eyes, an overwhelming tiredness washes through my skull. And beneath that wave of exhaustion, I hear something. I hear a distinct beep. You taste like an ashtray, she says, with the world's slightest grin. And you look like shit. I haven't slept since Friday morning, I tell her. Why? She asks. I search for words. I search for some sort of explanation, but the facts of my situation struggle to stick together in my sleep-deprived brain. Want a coffee? I ask. Sure. She says, and then lies down on the couch. As she walks past me, the smell of her conditioner reminds me of the first night. I remember how she teased me about being an American. How she busted my balls for being another foreigner teaching English in Prague. How her hair smelled as she fell asleep in my arms. I remember how soft her bed was. I brew her a cup of coffee. As the machine grinds away at the beans, I can't help but watch her tap away at her phone. There's nothing I want more than to lie down next to her and rest my head on her breasts. The land of sleep beckons me from her bosom, but I resist. I know I have to resist. I make myself four espressos in a single mug. When I sit down next to her, she throws her long legs on my lap and starts cheerily chirping away about something. Her accent never gave me trouble over the past couple of months, but the tension behind my eyeballs makes it impossible to understand a word she is saying. Hey. She nudges me with her foot. You okay there, big guy? I try to reply, but it feels like a lethargic worm has replaced my tongue. I take a long, scalding gulp of my coffee. My tongue still feels foreign, but the burning pain that travels down my throat gives me some semblance of control over my words. Remember Teddy? I ask her. Yeah. She says. Your missing skeleton boy roommate, right? I almost tell her not to call him that, but I don't. Petra's tendency for cruelty is the last thing on my mind right now. Yeah, I say. His parents held a memorial service back in Baltimore yesterday. No one is searching for him anymore. Oh. She says, her fiery eyes growing dim with empathy. Sorry. I didn't mean to call him Skeleton Boy. How are you doing? The door to Teddy's room is still open. Past the VHS tapes on the floor, I see his bulky television. I found him, I say. What? She asks, sitting up. His dad invited me to speak at the service, even offered to pay for the airfare. But I don't know. It just didn't feel right. I barely knew Teddy. I mean, we lived together and the kid was chill, 
but the only thing I really knew about him was that he collected VHS tapes. Didn't feel right to speak in front of his grieving family. But I figured that... I don't know. If the guy's gone, if the guy's dead, I should at least pay him a little bit of respect to his memory. I never asked him about his collection because I didn't care, but I figured he'd like it if I made an effort. So I watched one of his tapes. That's sweet. She says, leaning over and wrapping her arms around me. That's really sweet. Those grime-filled eyes. That filthy hair. The screaming. Sweet is the last descriptor that I would use for what I found inside Teddy's VCR. Petra's hug eases those images out of my mind, but her embrace is far too comforting. It's too soft. I feel my eyes closing. I hear that infernal beep echo through the core of my being. I shrug her off. I wanted to watch like, like a Friends episode or something, I tell her. But when I turned on the TV, there was already a tape inside of it. Professor Egghead's Adventures. Never heard of it, she says. Petra leans back on the couch and gives up on the embrace. Yet she continues to caress me with her foot. On any other day, I'd welcome her advances. But I know I have to save my energy. I know I have to stay awake if I'm going to stay away from him. It's not a show, I say. The tape I found inside of Teddy's VCR is not a sitcom like the rest of his collection. It's... I search for words. The only thing that comes to mind is the word abomination. But I doubt she knows that word. I doubt she'd understand. It's really bad, I finally say. I watch the tape and, and there's this, this man or creature, or, or monster. I don't know what to call him. He's a man shaped like an egg with horrible, horrible eyes. Professor Egghead. He calls himself Professor Egghead, and he just screams. He screams about science. He screams about demanding attention. He screams, and he hurts people. That's why you haven't slept for a day, because you are scared of this. Professor Egghead that you saw on the television. With every word that leaves her lips, I can feel her pulling away from me. She came here because she thought I was having a bad day and needed company, but now she thinks I'm fundamentally broken. I don't blame her. The visage of Professor Egghead has shattered my life. He's not just on the television, I say, trying to explain my terror. I mean, yes, he's on the television, but he exists somewhere else. Professor Egghead exists somewhere beyond the scope of... Look, I, I, I found Teddy. Professor Egghead trapped Teddy in the television, and now Professor Egghead is trying to trap me. Petra raises one perfect eyebrow in confusion. I swear I'm not lying. On the tape, Professor Egghead went to a fast food restaurant, and Teddy was behind the register. I swear to God it was him. That's why no one could find Teddy when he went missing. It's because he somehow got trapped inside of the television. Somehow Professor Egghead got to him, and now he's after me. There's this scene. At the end of the tape, there's a scene where Professor Egghead goes shopping, and there's no one behind the cast register. He wants me there. He looked at me from the screen and demanded that I get behind the cash register and serve him. He wants to trap me inside of the television just like he trapped Teddy. I hope that telling her would lessen the burden on my tired shoulders, but it doesn't. Petra stares at me like... like I just escaped a mental institution. For a moment, I feel like she'll just give up and leave, like she'll abandon me with the horrible reality I've been thrust into. But then she smiles. And it drags in the house. I swear to God, I'm not on drugs. It's all real. Please, Petra. I need you to believe me. Ugh, you Americans with your swear to gods. She sighs. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if there's any drugs in your house. There's some weed on my desk, I think. Good boy. She says as she gets up and strolls over to my room. I watch her as she leaves. 
hoping that some primal part of my brain will find distraction in her figure. But I don't. The only body that I can think of is the misshapen mass of Professor Egghead. Come here! Petra yells from the bedroom. By the time I drag myself over, the pipe is already back on the bedstand and thin wisps of smoke hang around Petra's head. Sprawled out on my soft bed, the morning light caresses her legs. She nudges the side of the mattress with her foot, calling me to sit. My drained body obliges. So, there is a man made of eggs in the television who kidnapped your old roommate, and now he's going to kidnap you. She says. Do I understand correctly? He's not actually made of eggs. He's like one big egg with a human face and a lab coat. I try to explain. But her face leaves little room for nuance. Yes, I say. That's, that's pretty much it. And you can go to sleep, why? The word sleep sounds like an invitation from her lips. It echoes through my mind. Sleep. Sleep. Sleep is all I need. My eyes feel heavy. For a moment they close. And then... Beep. If I go to sleep, he'll get me. When he was in the supermarket, when I watched the television, I can't explain it, Petra. It's like he reached out for me. It's like I was there. I could feel him looking at me. I could see the fluorescent lighting of the supermarket. I could hear the beeping of the checkout machines. I turned off the television and got away, but now... Whenever I go to sleep, I can feel him reaching out. When I close my eyes, I can hear the beeping of the checkout machines. Her face wavers between laughter and concern, but she finally just shakes her head and smiles. So what, you are just never going to sleep again? The thought has crossed my mind before. The thought of it all eventually ending, of me falling asleep. I don't allow myself to go down the hopeless rabbit hole again. I called Teddy's father as soon as I saw his son on the television. He's flying over to check out the tape. I hope that if he watches it, somehow this will all end. I hope that this can all end. Petra stares at me in disbelief. You called your missing roommate's father on the day of his son's memorial. Are you sick? Petra, I swear to... I swear this is all real. I know this sounds crazy, and I know I sound crazy, but please, I need you to believe me. Wordlessly, she reaches for the pipe again. You're lucky you're cute. She says. When's Daddy's father coming? Tomorrow evening. The words burn on my tongue. I know I can't last that long, but I know it's my only hope. I just want you to stay with me until tomorrow evening, and then, and then maybe this will all end. You're lucky you're cute. She repeats, less enthused than before. Her delicate fingers brush against my arm. On any other occasion, I would welcome them, but as she caresses me, I shudder and pull away. Even though her fingers are long and sleek, they still remind me of Professor Egghead's stubby limbs. So, how are you going to stay awake? Coffee. Coffee and energy drinks, I say. The sink in the bathroom is also filled up with ice water in case of an emergency. How about some physical exercise? She asks, pulling me closer. Petra, we shouldn't, I reply. Oh, come on! You make me come all the way across the city just so you can tell me some man made of eggs is going to capture you if you fall asleep. What am I getting out of this? Do you not believe me? What do you think? I can show you the tape. It's still in Teddy's VCR. If you just- I don't want to see the tape. I came here to see you. If you want me to stay here until Teddy's father arrives, I can. Maybe I'll even tell you a nice bedtime story when everything is over. Just let me wake you up a bit. His grubby little hands. That's all I can think about as she touches me. Her piercing eyes are filled with sex, but they are irrelevant. I know 
that somewhere out there, attached to a pale and misshapen body, there are two bloodshot eyeballs covered in grimy crust, watching me, waiting for me to slip. Yet I know that I cannot face the egg-shaped abomination alone. I know I need her. Promise you'll stay, I ask. Scout's honor. Petra replies as she pulls me towards her. She kisses me. I lack the strength to resist. We're in bed alone, but the act might as well be a threesome. Under my hands, her skin feels like rough eggshell. Beneath each moan she lets out, I hear his frantic shouts about science. There are moments when I forget Petra's even in the room. All I know is that his sleepless eyes are watching me. I try to resist, but I can't. The blinding glare of fluorescent light bulbs drown out her naked body. I hear the sounds of checkout machines. There's a meek looking balding man standing by my register. His shopping cart contains a fancy looking bottle of red wine, a box of Swiss chocolates, a 12 pack of Durex extra safe condoms, and a child sized package of Harry Bow gummy bears. He refuses to look in my eyes. No. No, no. I whisper, desperately hoping to be elsewhere. Wake up. Wake up, god damn it. Behind me, a sad looking woman scans a can of beans. She wears the same dark blue supermarket uniform as me. She doesn't scan any new items. She just keeps scanning the same can over and over. The sad elderly man on the other side of the checkout counter doesn't seem to mind. He knows there isn't much time left. Somewhere from beyond the dog food aisle, I hear the faint beginning of applause. He's coming. Professor Egghead is coming. Escape. My mind immediately turns to the thought of escape. Of getting away from the walking fever dream that is on an unavoidable path towards my checkout register. Yet as I look past my workstation, to where the exit from the supermarket would conceivably be, all I see is the faint dim of television static. The world I stand in is not my own. The world I stand in is his and he draws the boundaries. The applause grows in volume. The invisible audience is excited to see their favorite character. How do I get out of here? I ask the balding man. He doesn't acknowledge me. Instead, he stares into the television static beyond, waiting for the inevitable. With shaking hands, I grab his shirt. Please, there has to be a way out. His eyes stay glued to the confounding universe of madness in front of him. But his lips part slightly. Don't fight it. He whispers. He makes it worse if you fight it. Someone has to know. I yell at the procession of carts behind the man. The applause grows wild. A shopping cart squeaks towards the back of the line. The moment of reckoning is at hand. Please, someone, help me get away from him. I am Professor Egghead! He screams from behind the line of terrified shoppers. I have arrived to exchange monetary tokens for goods. I must start my domicile quickly so that I can commit the rest of my time on this planet to science. I do not see his misshapen body past the other shoppers, but I see his cart. It's filled up with dog food and toilet paper. I have arrived to trade goods. I have taken a break from my work in the field of science to prolong my survival in this modern society. He raves, ramming his cart into the middle-aged couple in front of him. 
But I have no time for waiting. I must make my purchase now so I can work on my inventions. The studio applause explodes into laughter as a man is visibly injured by Professor Egghead's overfilled cot. Yet as the monstrosity advances in the queue, the laughter stops. The shoppers are no longer staring into the wall of static. They're looking at me. I'm meant to say something. Please. I plead with them. Help me. I don't belong here. Please, I... I have come here expecting speedy service. I have come here expecting the respect and adoration that Professor Egghead deserves. But instead, I am stuck behind the masses. Instead, I am treated like a rabid dog awaited his execution. The professor's insane ramblings get a couple of chuckles out of the studio audience. But the silence soon returns. Everyone is staring at me. Tell him he has to wait his turn. The balding man mumbles with fear in his voice. Tell him he has to wait his turn, and this will all end much quicker. Terrified. With no other direction in life. I follow the balding man's instructions. Y you have to wait your turn, Professor Egghead. I say. What? The cruel voice rages from the back of the line. I will do no such thing. I am a man of science, not a man of waiting. The audience explodes into another burst of applause as the abhorrent creature waddles out from behind a shopping cart. His deformed egg-shaped body is barely covered by his greasy lab coat. Filthy strands of jet black hair jut out of his pointed scalp like the claws of a demon. He is a nightmare personified. With spine-chilling speed, his stout hands grab the dress of the woman in front of him. In one swift motion, he sends her clattering to the ground. A loud crack escapes from her body as it meets the floor. The studio audience applauds and laughs and cheers at the violence. Energized by invisible spectators, Professor Egghead moves to the next shopper and drives them to the ground as well. In a series of brutal assaults, Professor Egghead attacks each and every person in his way. None of them get back up. Just follow the script. The balding man says. Follow the script and don't make him angry. If he gets angry, he'll... <coughs> the man's sentence is finished by a crack as his skull meets the floor. Red and tired diseased. Professor Egghead's drooping eyes stare into my soul. For a moment, he just looks at me, his sharp tooth mouth smiling at the discomfort he is brewing in my soul. But then, with a burst of pep in his step, he travels to the back of the line. As he moves past the unmoving bodies of the innocent shoppers, he overturns their carts to clear the way for his own groceries. The corpses don't bother him. As he moves back towards me, he lets his shopping cart crush everything beneath his path. A trail of mangled bodies and blood lies in his wake. Spit festers in the corners of his angry mouth. With my powerful brain, I have already calculated the monetary worth of my purchase. Professor Egghead screams. There is no need for you to waste my time with your maddening barcodes. He reaches into the pocket of his lab coat and produces three lumpy pieces of stone. Not being able to reach my register, the egg-shaped man is forced into labored hops. 
After three unsuccessful attempts to put the stones on the counter, he finally succeeds. The invisible audience finds this deserving of thunderous applause. These are precious minerals that I have collected from beneath the ground. I trust that you will find them of equal value to the goods that I have purchased. He yells up at me. I keep my eyes locked to the dark stone, hoping that Professor Egghead will leave, hoping that I will wake up back in my room next to Petra. But he doesn't leave. He keeps on staring at me, waiting. Tell him you only accept cash or credit. A human's voice pleads from behind the counter. The balding man's head is trapped beneath one of the wheels of the overfilled cart. Blood drips from his mouth, yet his pained eyes still manage to meet mine. Please, just tell him what he wants to hear. No, I yell. No, this is all wrong. I don't want to be here. The tape wasn't mine. I wasn't meant to watch it. I want to go back. A moment of silence drags into a tense eternity. But eventually someone in the invisible audience boos. They are joined with a legion of hisses and jeers. As if the angry crowd was a source of some unspeakable power, Professor Egghead jumps. In one instantaneous show of agility, the grotesque scientist leaps on top of the checkout counter. I am Professor Egghead! Master of the mind, dominator of the sciences. He bellows. You will submit. With the strength of a sucker punch, the professor rockets himself into my abdomen. In an instant, I am knocked to the ground, struggling to breathe. I try to bat the heavy egg creature away, but his plump fingers seize my arm. I am Professor Egghead! He screams as his powerful hands start to crush my arm. I demand your obedience! The pain is unbearable. The pain is incomprehensible. The pain causes all my pleas for freedom to turn into throat-burning screams. I feel my bones starting to shatter beneath his grasp. I demand it! I demand it! I demand- A thud and a crack. A blunt force sends a bolt of pain through my face. Blood starts to pour out of my nose. I try to lift myself up, but my right arm refuses to move. I bleed on the floor. I bleed on the floor of my bedroom. Bad dream? Petra asks, leaning over the side of my bed. Reality comes crashing down on me harder than the heavy egg that just attacked me. I am beyond happy that I have escaped the fat-fingered clutches of the professor. I am overjoyed to be safe and alive in a world that I can make sense of. But the joy is overtaken by anger. My eyes burn with sleep deprivation and rage as I look up at the naked woman leaning over my bed. You let me fall asleep. Or you passed out and before you threw yourself off the bed, you looked pretty peaceful. I thought maybe you just needed some rest. You were acting crazy. You bitch. Excuse me? You let me fall asleep. I told you about him. I told you that he would get me if I fell asleep. You were meant to help me stay awake. What did you call me? Look what he did to me! The part of my arm that Professor Egghead gripped burns with pain, but the skin is only slightly reddened. I clamber up to my feet to get closer to her, to show her what the Eggman did to me, to show her what she could have stopped, but I don't get that far. As soon as I'm standing, a new wave of exhaustion washes through me with dizzying force blood drips from my nose. With every drop I feel weaker. I summon all of my strength and dash to the bathroom. The ice bath in my sink shocks me awake. I stare at the clogged up drain. The frigid water feels like chlorine against my eyes. Everything hurts and everything is chaos. 
I know I can't resist the pull of sleep forever. I know I'm doomed. Yet as my bleeding nose turns the white of the porcelain pink, a memory emerges. A memory that provides a solution. For a split second, I'm not in some dingy bathroom in Prague. I'm back outside Boston. It's 2012, and I'm sitting at home watching AMC with my dad. The television gives us an interesting bit of information about Czech Republic. I'm leaving. I barely hear her past the water. What? I thought you were gonna stay! Petra! Petra, I need your help! I'm leaving, she says, standing in the hallway. She already has her underwear on. A t-shirt dangles from her hand, and a cold anger lingers in her eyes. Is it because I called you a bitch? Her face responds adequately. I didn't mean it! I'm sorry, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm just really stressed. I know the whole Professor Egghead thing sounds crazy, but, but I'm sorry for calling you a bitch. I, I won't do that again. The t-shirt continues dangling from her hand. She doesn't put it on. I'm sorry that I dragged you into this, Petra. I really am. I should have told you before I invited you over. No one wants to spend their Saturday with a crazy guy talking about men made of eggs. I promise I'll make this up to you. I just need your help on one thing. She probed me with her eyes, not letting a single hint of emotion show on her face. How will you make this up to me? She finally asks. However you want. What do you want me to do, Petra? It depends. What do you need help with? I need to find some meth. Meth? Meth. Yes, meth. Back home, we had this show called Breaking Bad, where a science teacher starts cooking up really strong methamphetamines. Him and his friends start exporting drugs to the Czech Republic because you guys are the biggest consumers of the stuff in the world. Petra doesn't answer. She just pulls on a t-shirt and stomps off to my bedroom. I follow her, pleading, leaving a trail of bloodied water on the linoleum. Oh, come on, you have to know someone, right? There has to be some truth to this show, right? Wordlessly, she pulls on a single sock. But as she reaches for the second one, her scowl breaks into angry words. You've lived here for what? A year? You've lived here for a year, and you still base your understanding of my culture on some bullshit Hollywood show. I sit down on the bed next to her. The gentle fluff of the covers makes me feel like I'm sitting on a cloud. Sleep calls to me from the mattress. Petra, please. And not that it's a matter of a national pride, but we are not just the biggest consumer of methamphetamines, we are also the biggest producers and exporters of the stuff. To imply that it would make sense to export drugs across the Atlantic is just more bullshit American exceptionalism. <sighs> With a single sock on her foot, she yells at me. At moments, I am unsure if she's yelling at me because of who I am as a person or if she's yelling at me because I'm an American. It doesn't make a difference. When she finishes her rant, Petra throws on the rest of her clothes and marches out my door. I'm left alone, sleep-deprived and methless. The red bruise on my arm turns black. After another quadruple shot of espresso, I pick up my phone and call anyone and everyone in my contact list who could possibly have access to drugs. I am met with laughter and confusion every time. When I push for information, I am met with a dial tone. In between the frantic phone calls, I shove my head in the cold water in the sink with hopes of prolonging my consciousness. As the rejections mount, the ice starts to melt. By the time I have no one left to call, all I'm left with is a sink full of pink lukewarm water. For a moment, I consider restocking the ice, but the creeping darkness outside whispers promises of rest. I know that I can't last another 24 hours in my apartment without going to sleep. Pulling on my coat, I walk out into the cold November night. The crisp fall air steadies me somewhat as I leave my house. But the flash of alertness doesn't last long. Soon enough, I'm aimlessly walking through the city of Prague, unsure of how I will resist the pull of the nightmarish egg creature that haunts me. 
Even though the architecture of the city is of rough gothic stone, I can't help but to find it soft. The world is soft. Every bench, every tram stop, every medieval divot in the ancient structures calls to me and invites me to lie down and rest. I stagger across the cobblestone, trying to remind myself of what will happen if I dare to dream. I find myself standing on the brightly lit Wenceslas Square. A statue of the Czech patron saint towers at the end of the boulevard, promising protection from all the forces that would dare harm the country. Grand structures of Parisian architecture spread out in front of him, promising a culture that will never be forgotten. Hey boss, looking for girls? Next to me stands a strip club promoter wearing an oversized top hat and a glimmering coat of fake gold. Hottest girls in all of Prague. Free entry. He says, smiling a salesman's grin. No thank you, I reply, remembering my previous attempt to distract myself from the demented reality of Professor Egghead with the female form. Ah, American. You are here to party, yes? I can show you the wildest bars, best beer, best girls, best fun. I live here, I reply. This completely changes his demeanor. Fuck off then, he says, realizing he can't sell me on any of the tourist traps. Go back home to your cheeseburgers. Not wanting to break my nose a second time, I start to walk away. But then I stop. I look at the man. He no longer looks like the product of an affair between a magician and a carpet. For a moment, in the flickering of the electric lamplight, he looks like my only hope. Hey, I say, do you know where I can find some meth? At first, I don't feel it. At first, I'm just a bruised up corpse, wavering in and out of consciousness, but then, a jolt. A serrated bolt of lightning flashes from the core of my being out to my extremities. My fingertips feel electric. I'm wide awake. I'm not scared anymore. I'm fucking wired. A dirty energy roars through my body. I feel a thousand filthy suns burn in my chest. A rush of power so overwhelming, so ecstatic, that I can't help but to howl. Like a fucking wolf, I call out to the moon that I know shines for me somewhere beyond the city. My nose might be broken and the feeling in my right arm may be gone, but I am a raging, walking god. Screw you, Professor Egghead, I scream, clutching the bathroom mirror. You can't get me when I'm awake. You can't do shit. I'm the one in charge now. There's a knock on the door. McDonald's security. They're saying they'll call the cops. I grab the baggie and bolt out the door. They're not chasing me, but I don't stop running. I sprint through the old town of Prague and let the history of the city envelop me. The place is like a thousand years old, centuries and centuries of cobblestone and churches and bullets and blood. And I'm on top of it all. I am the apex predator. My heart beats like it's about to jump out of my chest and my entire being vibrates with a newfound will to live. It takes me a good minute to realize my phone is ringing. Oh, <laughs> fuck, it's Teddy's father. Hi, just call in and let you know I'm on the way to the airport. Couldn't find any direct flights in such short notice, but with a couple layovers, I should be landing at around 8 p.m. tomorrow local time. Cool. I say, still running. No need to be in the house when I arrive. I, I still have Teddy's keys. That's great. I try to focus on the conversation, but I can't. 
The lights of the city, the fresh air, the power boiling in my veins. It's all so infinitely more interesting. For a moment he's silent, but then Teddy's father lets out a labored sigh. I'm also calling to apologize for yelling at you. I didn't mean to get angry, it's just that I love my son. When his mother passed, it was a difficult time for both of us. Teddy went off to his own little world with his collections, and I figured that if that's what he needed to do, I thought supporting Teddy during his move to Prague would help bring back my son, but I don't understand this business with the tape. I hope I will understand tomorrow. Look, I just wanted to apologize for yelling at you, and I also wanted to thank you. For what? For being Teddy's friend. He spoke very highly of you. Another burst of euphoria flows through my chest. Of course Teddy spoke highly of me. I'm a really cool guy. Just as I'm about to say something to the same effect to Teddy's father, however, I accidentally hang up the phone. The man doesn't call back. Thoughts of the sad man disappear behind the sheer enjoyment of my drug-fueled sprint. I stop at the clock tower, not because I'm out of breath. I could run 10 miles if I wanted to, but because my nose starts bleeding again. I fish out some loose tissues out of my jacket and contain the damage. Flashes of light. A group of tourists take pictures of me. I'm more interesting than the clock tower show. They'll all be telling their families about the strange energetic man covered in blood that they saw in Prague's old town. I pose for them, because why not? You only live once. I don't forget about him. I know that somewhere in the near future, I will come face to face with those rotting eyes again. But the thought doesn't bother me, because I just feel so fucking good. An hour ago, I was terrified of falling asleep before sunrise. Now I know that with enough willpower, I could outlast the nightmare for a hundred nights. The bell of the tower rings eight times. 8 p.m. That's when Teddy's father arrives tomorrow. That's when that horrible VHS tape will be out of my life. All I need to do is to keep myself occupied for the next 24 hours. With the chemical vitality coursing through my bloodstream, I don't have to cower in fear. I can prosper. A brave Chinese lady walks out of the crowd of tourists and poses in front of me. She's pointing at me, her face frozen in an exaggerated giggle for her husband's camera. I'm sure her family back home would get a kick out of the picture. But before her husband has a chance to snap the moment into eternity, I'm gone. I sprint to the subway station. I feel more energized than I ever felt in my life. I can't waste this boon of inspiration. I know what I have to do. The question of writing a book about my life was less of an if and more of a when question. As soon as I moved to Prague, I knew. I knew that I had a story worth committing to paper. Barely anyone who I went to high school moved outside of the suburbs. You know, they weren't brave enough to seize life by the horns. They stayed home and started working dead-end jobs and having ugly children. They let the comfort zone consume them. I didn't. I traveled far from home and left my comfort zone in the dust. As soon as I moved to the bright city of Gothic Stone, I knew that my life was going to get captured in a book. The nose full of meth just gave me the extra push that I needed. As soon as I entered the subway, paragraphs worth of words about the unfriendliness of the locals started to rapid fire in my mind. The carriage is full of grumpy Czechs who all look like someone spit in their food. Those tired faces, the rumbling of the train. It inspires me, but it also bores me. Not wanting my burst of vitality to be sucked away by the gray surroundings, I pop in my headphones. I hope that the drums of the warriors of Peru will keep me energized. And they do.
they even get me moving. At first, it's just a tap of the foot. As I take in the steady flow of music in my ears, I can't help but tap along to the beat. But as the music grows, as the rhythm of the drums turns savage, my feet give up on restraint. I start stomping along to the rapid fire blasts buzzing in my ears. Soon enough, I'm dancing. My nose starts bleeding again. The other commuters step back in disgust, but that just gives me more space to dance. My arms and legs move independently of conscious thought. My body sings a primal song to the breakneck temple of light. I stand in a steadily thickening pool of my own blood, but I've never felt more alive. The music beckons me towards a grimy rapture. I close my eyes and I follow it. Applause. Just as we pass Mihovske Nadraji, I hear applause. For a moment, I try to deny it. For a moment, I try to keep my eyes closed and focus on the powerful music in my ears, but I can't. I know he's watching me. I know Professor Egghead is nearby. The other passengers of the subway have cleared away to make room for my blood-soaked dance, but when I open my eyes, I see him in front of me. His body is still an egg-shaped abomination, only vaguely resembling a human. His stubby legs hang from the train seat like malformed baby limbs, but Professor Egghead's eyes are different. They are wide open and shaking. Amphetamines were first synthesized in 1887 by Romanian chemist Lazar Italianu. The egg creature rasps breathlessly as if he was delivering a lecture in front of a firing squad. Yet it wasn't until the Second World War that they attained common usage. Nearly all branches of the Fairmarked Armed Forces utilized the benefits of the miracle drug. Without amphetamines, the Blitzkrieg would have been impossible. I shut my eyes and turn up the music to a deafening volume. With my soul wavering between spine-crackling ecstasy and soul-shattering fear, I dance. I stomp, and I spin, and I jump, hoping to drown out the professor's demented lecture. Yet no matter how hard I try to ignore his high-pitched torrent of useless information, I know he's there. I know those quivering yellow eyes are watching me. When the subway arrives at my station, I burst out the door. For a blessed moment, I am alone. Sprinting through the dark streets, the night air starts to wash out the sweat and panic of my system. But the moment of energized tranquility doesn't last long. Behind me, I hear the brisk staccato of the professor's shoes. He's moving faster than an egg-shaped man ever should. Methamphetamines stimulate dopamine production in the user's brain beyond the scope of any activity or substance. The nightmare screeches as he runs behind me. Sexual intercourse increases the dopamine's units to 200. Cocaine and heroin increase the dopamine's units to 400. Methamphetamines Increase the brain's dopamine production to 1,500 units. On a chemical scale, there is nothing like the pleasure that is coursing through your veins right now. My hands are so numb, I have trouble finding my keys. The drugs, the fear, the pain, a chaotic system of filthy life buzzes in my veins, threatening to send me clattering down to the ground. Yet the toxic fire burning in my chest steadies me. When I finally get the door to the apartment complex open, I jump in and slam it shut. The forest of euphoria 
From the usage of methamphetamines, however, has its price. The professor says from behind the glass entrance to the complex. As I run to the elevator, I pray the locked door will keep him away from me. As I shake in the elevator, I even start to believe it. Yet by the time I reach my unit, he's standing in the hallway, waiting for me. What goes up must come down. That is science. I slam the door behind me. I lock it. I chain it. But it doesn't matter. When I turn around, the professor is on my couch, lying on his side, staring at me with his quivering eyes. The side effects of methamphetamine usage were so severe that within a year of the war effort, the Nazi high command restricted the stimulus for only the most dire of cases. The withdrawal effects left the soldiers... I put my earphones back in and head for my computer. The egghead continues detailing the dangers of methamphetamine withdrawal from my couch, but I don't listen to him. I don't care about suicidal migraines of psychosis. I can't afford to care about those things. I only care about staying awake until Teddy's father arrives. I open up Microsoft Word and stare at a blank page. At first, all I can think about is the egghead. At first, all I can think about are the prophecies of horrible withdrawal syndromes he whispers about. But the dirty sun that burns inside my chest flares up. A new overwhelming surge of energy courses through my body. I can't stop typing. The fingers on my right hand make mistakes, but I ignore their folly. Even though they shake and misjudge their movements, they are attached to a mind burning with inspiration. Typos can be corrected later. The magic flow of creativity cannot be postponed. As I weave gold on the page, time dissolves into nothingness. I become the center of the universe. Every step that I ever took back home was leading me to Prague. Everything I ever did in the States pointed me towards the Bohemian paradise where I could become the truest version of myself. From my depths, an autistic soul demands to be let out. My inner bohemian takes control. Yet as I write about my zany adventures in the heart of Europe, something else emerges from my depths. A headache. It starts off light, as a simple itch behind my eyes. But soon enough, it grows into a palpable strength. My nose starts to itch. The withdrawal symptoms from methamphetamine usage are so severe that most users will binge the drug just to avoid the come down phase. The egg shaped abomination's voice booms past my music. But no one can ever run forever. What comes up must come down. That is science. The morning sun illuminates him as if he were a deity. His eyes shine like two sickly moons. For a moment I believe him. For a couple beats of my tiring heart, I despair over the future that awaits me. But then I do more meth. The rush is just as instant as before, but I feel no need to vocalize it this time. I just go back to the keyboard and continue churning out my life story. As the hours fly by, the room becomes far too bright. I shut the windows. I dim the screen. I let my fingers work in the dark. Whenever the headache starts to crawl back through my skull, I reach for the magic powder. But the pain is relentless and my supplies are limited. By the time I start writing about Petra, all I have left is an empty plastic baggie. The headache persists. It squeezes any capacity my mind has for clear thoughts. The base of my skull feels like it's on fire. I'm in agony. And I feel empty. I feel so empty. You will come back to Professor Egghead, he says. Soon enough, you'll be back in the supermarket. Soon enough, 
You'll be making the audience laugh. <laughs> Soon enough, you'll serve me. Even in the dark room, I can see his eyes. They shine with an indescribable madness. They shake with unbridled excitement. Professor Egghead always gets what he demands. No, I yell, partly for him, but mainly to calm down the fire that's starting up in the pit of my stomach. I can do this. I can outlast you. When Teddy's father gets here, you'll be his problem. Professor Egghead always gets what he demands. He simply repeats. I make myself another quadruple espresso and turn on all the lights in the apartment. A sudden flash of brightness hurts my eyes and the coffee burns my tired tongue. But the real pain comes when I turn on the screen of my laptop. It's all gibberish. 47 single spaced Microsoft Word pages of random letters and numbers. The migraine, the broken nose, the soreness in my arm, it all hurts. But it's the realization that I am a moron that is true agony. My one saving grace, the one thing that stops me from just lying down and traveling to that horrid dimension of television static is the clock in the right hand side of the screen. 8.05 PM. Teddy's father is already in Prague and he is on his way to rid me of my egg shaped burden. Briefly, the thought of rescue eases my mind but a wave of exhaustion and pain takes precedent almost immediately. Any shred of confidence I have ever had in my life feels misplaced. The minutes pass like a slug crawling through broken glass. Every sound from the hallway is followed by a painful realization that Teddy's father is not behind the door. I find myself leaning back in the couch, dreading the drug-fueled running I indulged in the night before. I struggle with every part of my drained being to stay awake. Professor Egghead sits opposite of me, smiling. Professor Egghead always gets what he demands. He says, and then he yawns. <sighs> I yawn too. His eyes stop their frantic shaking. They still look sickly, but there's a calmness behind them. He yawns again. Come join Professor Egghead, he says, closing his eyes. Come and serve me in the name of science. I rush to the bathroom to retreat to my filthy sink. The water is murky with blood and grime, but I have no choice. Misjudging my footing, I end up slamming my face on the inside of the sink. The porcelain holds, but a string of warm scarlet blood travels through the pink water. I watch the blood flow from my nose, unsure of how much sleep deprivation I can take. My body answers my question. Not a lot. I gasp for breath, but almost immediately lower my face back into the sink. The world outside of the water is far too comfortable, far too warm, far too soft. I turn on the cold water tap and let a stream of frigid water cool the back of my head. It helps, but the exhaustion dragging my body down isn't something that can be fixed. My sleepiness is terminal. I stand by the sink, taking deep breaths and plunging my head underwater as if I'm trying to expand my lung capacity. But my body starts to give up. I start to wonder what would happen if I never came up for air. I start to wonder whether Professor Egghead would haunt me past the grave. I decided to test that theory. What are you doing? A kind voice screams before my face is hauled out of the murky water. Are you, are you trying to drown yourself? Please, please don't do that. There's already enough pain in the world. 
His sad blue eyes stare at me. In one hand, Teddy's father is clutching the side of my bloodied shirt. In the other, a pair of keys. What, what, what are you doing? He asks, his voice shaking. I have resorted to extreme measures to escape Professor Egghead, I say. He lets go of my shirt gently, letting me hold myself up against the sink. His eyes drift across the dirty bathroom. I see my reflection in the mirror. It doesn't look good. Did Teddy also do drugs? The man asks. No, I say. Ah, <sighs> good. He's about to say something else. He's about to ask me if I'm okay. But the beeping in the back of my skull informs me that there's no time for small talk. VHS in Teddy's room. I say, as I stumble past him. Professor Egghead is still sitting next to the couch. His eyes closed in a peaceful nap, but I don't care. The only thing I care about is getting the beeping that echoes through my soul to stop. I crash down on the couch and try to conserve the little energy I have left. Just watch the tape and get this egg-shaped monstrosity out of my life, I say. The man sets off to Teddy's room without a single word but he stops at the doorway. Past the mist of my tired eyes, I can see him looking at me. Thank you again for being Teddy's friend. He says. Sure. I sigh, too preoccupied with the cocktail of exhaustion and agony flowing through my body. Just watch the fucking tape, would ya? I say, trying to hold on with what little strength I have left. He closes the door, and soon enough, I hear the rumbling of a familiar canned applause. I sit up. The beeping in the back of my head disappears. The single piece of good news calms my flailing soul. The beeping is gone. I'm safe. The television next door booms with Professor Egghead's ravings. As the studio audience laughs and claps, the sleeping manifestation of the Egghead in front of me smiles. He looks like a baby with some terminal disease that's having a nice dream. Briefly, I feel like I might join him in the land of sleep. Like, I might finally get some rest. But a shout from the other room jolts me awake. Teddy! Oh, Teddy, what have they done to you? Teddy's father yells. The studio audience goes silent. Teddy, can you see me? It's me, Dad. I love you. Dad? I hear Teddy say. Dad, where are you? Help, I'm scared. <sighs> the studio booms from the television. The sleeping Eggman in front of me is no longer smiling. His disgusting eyes are wide open. He isn't happy. Without even looking at me, the professor gets up from his sleeping spot and waddles over to Teddy's bedroom. I am Professor Egghead! He screams. And these are my adventures! Teddy's father screams something, but he's drowned out by the wild clapping of the audience. For a moment, the whole apartment is filled with echoes of laughter and applause. But then, with an electric pop, everything goes silent. I lie on the couch, staring at the cracks in the ceiling, wondering if it's all over. But when I close my eyes, there is no beeping. When I close my eyes, I feel like I'm all alone. When I close my eyes, I feel like I can rest without becoming a character in Professor Egghead's adventures. The gates of sleep invite my tired soul to rest. I am more than willing to enter their soft kingdom, but I don't. Past the exhaustion and pain and methamphetamine withdrawal, there's still a part of me that is holding on to wakefulness. It's the part of me that craves closure. I shamble my way over to Teddy's room. The tape is paused on the opening shot of the fast food restaurant. Teddy still stands behind the counter wearing the red uniform he wore before, but he looks calmer. 
I grab the remote and press play. The customers still don't eat their burgers. The line still doesn't advance. The audience still ushers in the walking nightmare with excited applause. I am Professor Egghead. The egg-shaped abomination screams from the television. I demand the grilled carcass of an animal between two pieces of processed meat. I must receive nourishment before I indulge in the science. I'm sorry, sir. Teddy whispers like he did before. There are other customers. If you just wait your place in line... There are no other customers than me, Professor Egghead! The professor screams as he drags down the innocent bystanders to the depths. I demand flesh and bread! I demand fuel for my body! So I can commit my mind to science! Please, sir, don't hurt the other customers. Teddy begs. I will destroy all that is in my path in the name of science! Bring me a feast worthy of a philosopher king! By the time the maddening scientist is standing in front of Teddy, the kid is visibly shaking. But he still manages to get his lines out. Okay, Mr. Egghead. What can I get you? I am a professor! The Eggman screeches. I have attended all of the universities in the world. I have dedicated my life to the pursuit of knowledge, and I will be addressed with the respect that I deserve. I am sorry, Professor Egghead. What can I get you? I want the finest meat which the slaughterhouse can provide served on buns of processed virgin wheat. I'm afraid we don't have that item on the menu, Teddy says. But if you want, I can call my manager. Yes, I wish to communicate with the king of this eatery, not a mere cog in this dining machine. Call forth a master of the food so that I can be given the banquet I demand. Dad! Teddy yells. Dad, Professor Egghead wants to speak to you. The red uniform barely fits around the man's paunch, and Teddy's father looks unsure of his movements. Yet as he places his hand on his son's shoulder, a smile comes across his face. Hello, I am the manager of this fast food restaurant. How can I help you? A father and son working together this is the true meaning of family! This is the true meaning of love! Professor Egghead screams as the studio audience lets forth a round of awes. The only love which I know is my undying love of science! I only have lab beakers and microscopes to hug! The Egghead is so alone! Professor Egghead's admission of loneliness makes the audience explode with laughter. Watching the father and son stand together in front of the unhinged monstrosity brings a smile to my face. Even past the roaring pain that claws at my body, I can appreciate a happy ending. I find myself laughing along with the invisible crowd. But then, I stop. A familiar supermarket flickers on the screen of the television. The checkout lane is still empty. The balding man stands in front of the line with his cot. He's looking at me. There's no escape from Professor Egghead, he says. Many have tried and none have succeeded. His demands will always be met. Just follow the script and... The visage on the screen explodes into a burst of electricity and shattered glass. After throwing the remote through the television, I rip out the VCR and stomp it into tiny bits of plastic. 
as I destroy the place from which Professor Egghead first came, I find myself weeping. I find myself weeping for my lost soul. No amount of tears or force, however, can stop the unstoppable. Professor Egghead's demands are always met. As I write this, I'm lying on the couch, a bruised up corpse, wavering in and out of consciousness. I have resigned myself to my fate. I know that I will be a part of Professor Egghead's adventures soon. I know I can't fight destiny anymore. If there's one thing I can give to this world before I'm forced into the demented dimension in which the Egghead makes his demands, it's a warning. If you ever find a VHS tape titled Professor Egghead's Adventures, don't watch it.